Joining us now in the Cypher Brief studio is former Secretary of Defense Mark Esper. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thanks so much for being here. It's nice to see you again. Yeah, it's great to be with you. Thank you. You know, I, I really have to ask sort of your, your personal opinion. Uh, you've sat in the chair of the Secretary of Defense. You are seeing events in the region continue to escalate. What's top of mind for you as you're watching these headlines come in literally almost minute by minute? Well, you've jumped straight to the, the topical issue, huh? Uh, look, it's obviously a very dangerous world, and it's got uh, what, what happened uh, last night with the Iranian uh, ballistic missile attack is a, was a significant but feckless attempt to strike back at Israel. And I think we're all waiting now to see how Israel responds. That will dictate the course of events here, uh, you know, in the coming days and weeks. And that's just one front. We have the Hezbollah front, where Israel appears to be on the cusp of, uh, of an invasion, uh, at least a limited one. And then, of course, uh, uh, they are still confronting Hamas in Gaza at the same time. Right. Uh, let me kind of ask you, how does this work behind the scenes? How closely do you think, and I know that you don't have a crystal ball, but how closely are Israel uh, and the U.S. Uh, collaborating or, or at least talking about um, organizing, uh, communicating about what a response could look like by Israel? Because so far it looks like the U.S. has been sort of told after the fact on several occasions um, as Israel has decided to take action. Well, I can't speak to the relationship right now between, for example, uh, Lloyd Austin and his counterpart. But I will tell you, during my tenure, it was very close, certainly at the mill-to-mill -mill level. Uh, th there's a lot of exchange of uh, personnel and views and constant communication at multiple levels of command. And at the civilian level, there was, too. Uh, my counterpart was Benny Gantz, and Benny and I talked quite often. So I, I can't, again, speak to what's happening uh, right now, but I can tell you it's, it's always been a strong foundation between our countries. It's based on shared values shared interest in a, in a long-term relationship between our peoples. What would you guess right now uh, would be a likely Israeli response to this attack? Well, I suppose they're going to go after uh, different sets of targets. One, might, of course, might be the strategic aim of knocking out their uh, nuclear sites or nuclear facilities. Another might be going after um, air defense systems or ballistic m missile production sites. Or they could go after economic targets, such as their oil refineries. And, and, uh, and other facilities they have in the region that provides them the means, the money, if you will, to continue to supply their proxy networks. Yeah. In terms of uh, launching any kind of attack on nuclear facilities there, would this be sort of a temporary setback in terms of uh, the development of Iran's nuclear program? Or do you think there's an opportunity here to, to have a more lasting impact on that particular program? Well, in, in situations like this, it's, it's usually just temporary. It's hard to, if a country is determined to pursue a certain technology, uh, if you can set them back by destroying facilities or taking out the people behind it, it's just a matter of time before they build new facilities, acquire new technology, train new scientists. So at the end of the day, it's really just a setback. Uh, the question is, can you set it back long enough uh, for you to pursue other uh, avenues, if you will, of rolling back their program, whether it's a diplomatic, economic, or military? Uh, so, so that's how I would frame it. How are you looking at the opportunity for Israel to, um, to really make progress on the proxy groups, the Iranian proxy groups? We've already seen what they've done to Hamas since October 7th of last year. We've seen what they've been able to do to Lebanese Hezbollah just over the past several weeks. Um, how likely of a lasting impact do you think those actions are going to have on their ability to continue to launch attacks against Israel? Well, in... Uh in Gaza, they've knocked out uh, 22 of 24 battalions. Uh, they've taken out many of the leaders, but not the most important one, Yeya Sinwar. And so I think the question will is, uh, what, what's the future going forward? I'm a believer in a two-state solution, but certainly you cannot have Hamas at some any point going back in and governing, uh, policing, providing public services to the people of, uh, of Gaza. So you've got to make sure that, that uh, Hamas doesn't reemerge, that if anything, at worst, it's, a, it's an insurgency. So that would be that. On Hezbollah, uh, it's kind of the same situation applies, although you have a nation state, of course, which has been, uh, which has been infected like a cancer by, uh, by Hezbollah. And so the question will be at the end of the day, can you get a return to the uh, UN Resolution 1701 agreement that pushed Hezbollah, or supposed to push Hezbollah way off the border to the north, up along the Latani River. Of course, at the end of fighting in 2006, Israel lived up to its obligations, moved south, and Hezbollah never lived up to its, to its. So it stood on a border, and that's why over the past 11 months, they've been able to successfully attack uh, Israeli villages, communities right along the border. And so the, the, the one option is you push them back north, you take out their, um, uh, their long-range weapon systems, their leadership has already been decimated, 
and, um, and, and maybe you can get finally a, an agreement with UN peacekeepers and others to make sure that the border is maintained safe and free of Hezbollah. Yeah, um, it's a fascinating perspective. I, I, you know, I think everyone's really waiting with bated breath uh, to see what happens next. So escalation is the real issue uh, between now and probably certainly the next several days. Uh, what might Iran do, do you think, uh, if its nuclear sites were in fact targeted by Israel? Well, the question Iran has to ask, ask itself is, if they attack again, what will Israel do? And we know that Iran does not want a full-fledged war with Israel, let alone Israel and the United States. So I think uh, uh, Iran here is on really tricky ground, a really uncertain ground. They no longer have a viable proxy in Hamas. Uh, their, their proxy, their favored one, the crown jewel in their ring of fire, Hezbollah has been decimated. The leadership is gone. Uh, they're on their back hills. And, uh, and, and those were the two punches that that Israel really packed. The third one, maybe the most important one that they own, were ballistic missiles. And those have been proven to be ineffective. So the question is, what is left for Iran to do? What punches can it throw uh, back at Israel and the United States and, and other allies in the region? You know, I'm going to probably ask you a question no one's asked you yet, uh, because we, we are looking at sort of a, a global connectivity among allies now that we have not seen in the past. So I really want to ask you, what are your thoughts just stepping back a little bit, uh, given your, your former role? about the new alliance sort of that's been growing over the last couple of years now between China, Russia and Iran. Uh, is that at all playing on your mind in terms of what's happening next? Are we, are we wrong to focus only on the Middle East and not see those other connections? Well, we should not focus only on the Middle East. The, the partnership, I call it, is not just with China, Russia and Iran, it's North Korea as well. And so what you see, this increased trade, the sharing information, the uh, kind of parallel collaboration between the two. You have North Korea providing rockets, missiles, and uh, 155 millimeter ammunition to Russia. Russia, in exchange, is providing technology back to North Korea. We see the same trade going on between Russia and Iran. So Iran provides Russia with drones and ballistic missiles to shoot into Ukraine. And in exchange, Russia is selling air defense systems, maybe jet fighters, which would be a major step up, and space technology. And and uh, so this trade has to discontinue. We, China, for example, is providing dual-use items to Russia. In exchange, we fear that maybe Russia is providing advanced submarine technology. So you see this block of countries, the autocracies of the world, uh, coming together, uh, working as a block, certainly trading, currency flows, oil flows. Of course, once Europe cut off uh, Nord Stream and Russia was forced to sell its gas elsewhere, where are they selling it? They're selling it to China. So that's what you see happening out there, and it's certainly a, a problem that we have to deal with. Yeah, I, I think you just really summed up a very complicated global environment in a very uh, easier to understand way. Uh, let me just uh, finally uh, ask you, what are you going to be looking for next in terms of what's happening in the region and any potential escalation that might be a wild card? Yeah, well, obviously, I think what it, it'll be Israel's response, uh, number one. Number two will be, what does Israel do with regard to Lebanon? Do they, do they go in? I expect they will. But the question is, how do they go in? How long? What will happen? Um, we still have Hamas out there and, and the hostages that are still being kept by Hamas, so we can't forget about them. I think the wild card out there is this. Um, you know, uh, the, the people of Lebanon have been held hostage by Hezbollah now since, what, 1982, at least. And the question is, will at some point in time, will a window open for the people of Lebanon, the, the non-Hezbollah, Shias, Christians, Sunnis, etc., be willing to come together and push Hezbollah out, or at least suppress them as a, as a political player they are within that country. The, the people of Lebanon deserve far better than what Hezbollah has been bringing on them for the last at least 20 years, since 2006, and here we go again in 2024. So that would be my hope as a wild card. Yeah. Uh, former Secretary of Defense Mark Esper, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks so much for talking to us here at the Cypher Brief. Okay, thank you.